Historically, when it comes to iPhone versus Android, Androids are the phones known for being inexpensive. iPhones have generally always been priced high, whereas Android phones, while they can be priced quite high, offer an absolutely massive variety of different phones at literally any single conceivable price point. If you're someone who doesn't have a big budget but wants a brand new phone with some of the latest features, odds are you're not looking at Apple. Their cheapest phone is $430 American, a price that can be a lot more depending on your country, and that that phone has an eight-year-old design at this point. This leaves you with the absolutely giant selection of Androids in the low to mid range, and today we're looking at one of them. A phone not so popular in Western markets, but one very, very similar to many other budget phones out there. A OnePlus phone that has a 6.43 inch AMOLED panel that runs at 90 hertz, making for a very smooth software experience. You've got a 64 megapixel camera, 8 gigabytes of RAM, 128 gigs of storage, a micro SD card card slot, a headphone jack, strong battery life, a fingerprint sensor under the display, 5G networking, a nice design. On paper, this phone looks great, especially at its price of under $400. But does the experience actually match the spec sheet? Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and today we're shaking things up a bit and using this sub $400 Android phone, the OnePlus Nord CE2. Timestamps are in the description below if you would like to skip ahead, but I will start this off by saying that this phone was sent to me for free for for review. I'm not sponsored, but in the description below, you will find a link to this phone on the online marketplace Heka.com, a site that directly works with OnePlus as well as a lot of other manufacturers. They've got a lot of cool tech stuff over there, especially stuff you can't really find in North America. And if you use code 91tech10, you can get $10 off any order over 30 bucks. So that's a hecka good deal if you ask me. Get it? Because it's it's hecka, like the site site name, so <laughs> anyway, I'm not making any money off referrals, and if I was, I think they'd probably take it away after that joke, so checking them out is totally up to you, but that link is below. But back to the subject on hand, the OnePlus Nord CE2 with 5G. Boy oh boy, is that ever a mouthful. It's funny, because before getting this phone, I wasn't sure what to expect. The takes on the internet are very much controversial, with many writing this phone off as simply a cheap money grab on OnePlus's part, whereas actual reviews seem to be namely pretty positive, even if not particularly in enthusiastic. And this isn't an exciting phone. It's not going to have the specs or the premium experience that you would get with a thousand dollar smartphone, and it also kind of doesn't stand out in the sea of Chinese smartphones. The only thing that it has over a lot of them is that it's a OnePlus, a brand that has more name recognition in Western markets, and a company that has generally had a positive reputation, even if it's not nearly as strong as it once was. So for this video, I'm mostly putting all that talk I saw about this phone aside. I want to judge the Nord CE2 as is and also look at the budget side of Androids in general. Apple very recently released the iPhone SE3, which of course I've already reviewed, and that was a phone I found very difficult to give a proper opinion on. In a lot of ways, it's kind of the exact opposite of what you get with a phone like this. Actually, it pretty much straight up is the opposite. The Nord here offers some of the nicest features you can have in phones today, with a stylish design, the OLED panel, that hole punch cutout, and thin bezels. The one I have here is in this really cool color-shifting Bahama blue, and there's more of a gray blackish color if that's more your speed. You've got that massive camera setup, and the whole phone doesn't look too dissimilar from devices double its price. But with that, you have the drawback of cheaper materials and slower internal hardware. So nice on the outside, but a lot cheaper on the inside for the most part. The third generation iPhone SE, on the other hand, looks not too far off from the 2014 iPhone 6, with its big bezels and home button, although it feels premium in the hand thanks to the aluminum and glass build. It lacks the modern displays or camera setups of newer phones, but it does does have insanely powerful hardware on the inside with Apple's A15 Bionic chipset, a CPU that'll blow away any competition in pure power, and one that is completely and utterly overkill for a phone like this. Perhaps the ideal situation for a budget phone would be somewhere in between, but there's no getting around the fact that these two phones are made for very, very different audiences. The SE3 is a good option for those who want an iPhone and maybe like the home button, whereas the Nord CE2 is more for those who want a nice looking budget Android. This is a phone I feel that fits that niche pretty well, especially at the price it currently costs on Heka.com at $370. OnePlus isn't the same company they used to be, and their current phone lineup is very confusing. As I'm making this video, a new OnePlus has already come out in the Nord N20, though I believe it's exclusively available in the United States at the moment. It's a bit cheaper than the CE2, but it has a different design, a 60Hz display at the same size, a 48 megapixel camera, and less RAM at 6GB. I hate OnePlus's naming schemes right now, 
because hearing Nord N20 versus Nord CE2, you have zero way of actually distinguishing the two phones. And I said this phone doesn't really stand out, and it's not just because it's yet another budget Chinese smartphone, but because it's pretty much a direct clone of the Oppo Reno 7. Plus, this phone, again, is very similar to a lot of budget Androids around that price point, particularly not in North America. I'm not super familiar with these types of phones, so for me, it works as kind of a decent representation of the Android experience at this price point. And this phone, as much as I didn't know what to expect, it's still somehow what I expected. Right out of the gate, I do love the design. It looks really good, and it doesn't look particularly cheap in my eyes. It almost looks deceptively good. The build is very much plastic. It's sturdy, it's well built, so there's a bit of heft to it, which is good. I hate phones that are way too light, because you can just tell they're cheap. Just holding the phone in the hand, it feels worthy of the OnePlus name, at least on the surface. The display here is absolutely gorgeous, I'll be honest. I really like it. It's not going to come too close to a phone double the price, but it's certainly going to outdo the iPhone SE, and probably a lot of cheaper Androids. As mentioned in the beginning, we get a 6.43 inch AMOLED panel, and we have a resolution of 1080 by 2400, making for a pixel density of 409 pixels per inch, and we also have 90 hertz, which is a big deal here. It means all the content on the screen feels fluid and fast, versus slower 60 hertz screens like on the iPhone SE. This is a nice display, I really like it, and for the price point of 350-ish dollars, there's probably not too many phones brand new that will outdo it. While a high refresh rate display isn't necessarily a feature anyone needs because it doesn't make a huge impact on the experience, I think it does make it feel a lot smoother, which subconsciously makes the phone feel faster, so I do think it's a worthwhile feature seeking out if you're looking at budget Androids. Of course, we can't not mention the chin with the bottom bezel there. I'm not a fan of that, but this is a mid-range phone, and it's something that I pretty quickly forgot about when actually using it. The hole punch on the top left is fine, it's great, it's nice to have a more modern design element like that on a phone under 400 bucks. You've also got that under-display fingerprint reader that is very fast. Along with all that, you've got some nice quality of life features here. There's a micro SD card slot, which is amazing on any modern phone. And even better is the headphone jack. It's funny to me because there's this theme of cheaper phones having headphone jacks nowadays. You would think that paying more would get you more features, but sometimes less is more, I suppose, or something like that. You've got USB-C fast charging at 65 watts, which tops off the battery in only about 30 minutes, which is already pretty legit to begin with. And I was surprised to see that the 4500 milliamp hour battery does quite well for me, with even quite a bit of use over the day, ending with like a third left in the battery life, which is pretty darn solid. All of this in combination together makes for a solid package in the Nord CE2 on the surface. Under the surface, the price point starts to make a little bit more sense. For one, I was very disappointed to see that the phone is running Android 11 and Oxygen OS 11. No Android 12 straight out of the box, though they said that it will be available in the second half of 2022. It also looks like they're saying the phone will get two years of Android version updates and three years of security patches. Not a long time, but pretty standard for Android phones. And honestly, if this phone does get past Android 12, I'll be impressed. But of course, with Android, you don't necessarily need the latest update. The OS is much more open-ended and customizable, and Oxygen OS is probably one of the better skins out there, being quite lightweight and close to stock Android with very little bloat. The other option, and something that can really improve the experience of a lot of budget Androids, requires you to be a bit braver, and that's rooting the device and flashing it with a custom ROM. Though unfortunately, as of yet, it's not quite that simple. It does look like the bootloader is fairly easy to unlock. Now unfortunately, because this is a Dimensity chipset, not Snapdragon, they're a bit more of a pain to develop custom ROMs for, at least as far as I can tell. So I don't think there's any Lineage OS build or anything for it quite yet. You can keep your eyes open, especially on the XDA forums. And hopefully at some point we'll see the smartphone opened up a bit more and have a few more options. That all being said, don't do any of this unless you have some experience with it, just a general recommendation. So that's the software. It's Android 11 for now, will be Android 12 later this year, and it gets the job done. Ultimately, a phone like this is pretty much able to do anything the most expensive OnePlus 10 Pro can do. Yeah, it lacks some features, and it's not going to be near as fast, but it can run the same apps and do most of the same things any better phone can do. The model I have here is 8 gigs of RAM, which is fantastic. I do believe there is a 6 gig RAM version, but uh, heck, it doesn't sell that one. The chipset, on the other hand, isn't quite as appealing. At least it doesn't sound appealing. You've got the MediaTek Dimensity 900, which is a heck of a long name, but one you may notice doesn't have the word Snapdragon in it. MediaTek does have a reputation for making low-end chipsets, but that doesn't mean that they're bad. So comparing the Dimensity 900 to the Snapdragon 695, which is the chipset put into the Nord N20, we're seeing benchmarks put the MediaTek actually just slightly higher on most counts, which in the very least tells us performance should be roughly equivalent, if not superior. This is all pulled from nanoreview.net, which compiles a whole bunch of benchmarks 
benchmarks together, it's pretty useful. 3D Mark especially shows a big increase for the Dimensity 900, although realistically, these are still pretty low scores regardless. Interestingly about this specific chipset though, is that it's manufactured on a six nanometer node. Fancy tech speak to say that this makes the chip more efficient in the power department, and it's thanks to that that I was mentioning the battery life is lasting really darn well. And again, you've got the fast charging, so you're certainly not struggling for juice here. Now when it comes to actual performance, this phone doesn't feel slow to me. It feels actually fine. It's quite spiffy, and the 90 hertz really helps it feel smooth. I can, however, see it becoming slow fairly quickly after about a year or two, especially as it gets more and more bogged down with various downloads and applications as you use it. It's not going to be like a high performer in gaming, and quite frankly, if that's something that interests you, you'd be better off going for an actual gaming phone like the Black Shark 4 Pro, which I recently did a video on. And those phones do tend to offer top of the line specs for not a whole lot more money. But in all fairness, again, this phone doesn't feel slow with the animations being spiffy, helped by that fluid 90 hertz. And load times are pretty much near instant. Android here feels good. It's a pleasure to use and I wasn't having any issues. The eight gigs of RAM was great at keeping my applications open in the background, especially when you tend to cycle through a bunch of apps at once. But going through the Play Store and downloading apps, playing basic games, doing all these things, I had no lag. I had no performance drawbacks. You can't tell that this is a cheaper chipset because it feels good here. It won't be this way forever, but for now, it doesn't feel like a sub $400 phone. At least it doesn't feel that way until we talk about the cameras, which on the surface look great, and then slightly below the surface look bad, and a little bit deeper we get the actual picture. That's an unnecessarily convoluted way to describe how there's a triple camera setup on the back there for almost purely marketing reasons. Yeah, there is three cameras there. If you look closely, there's this really small camera lens that sits right above the flash. That one specifically is a two megapixel macro lens, which should probably remain untouched for taking most photos. A bit more useful is the eight megapixel ultra wide lens, which is at least there for situations where it might come in handy. But the main talking point will be that 64 megapixel main wide lens. And that's a high number, a higher number in fact than the OnePlus 10 Pro with its own 48 megapixels, believe it or not, though that's only the wide lens as it also has a ridiculous 50 megapixel ultra wide. It sounds good, but megapixel counts often don't run congruent with quality. In a recent review on the Nubia Red Magic, we saw that despite also having 64 megapixels, the camera took very poor photos, likely in part due to poor post-processing. But if you hear 64 megapixels and think, hey, that sounds good, keep in mind that's often not the case. So how does the Nord CE2 stack up? Well, it takes photos like I'd expect for most budget Androids for under $400. They're not the worst, but they're not very good either. And phones like the Google Pixel 5a and so on will offer much, much better performance in this category. In good lighting conditions, particularly outside during the day, you can honestly get some pretty decent shots with the main wide lens, and I'd label these certainly good enough. It did seem to have some weird issues with blowing out the highlights. Like here, it really actually wasn't that sunny in real life, but the leaves are so darn shiny and everything, it looks like it was just a glaring bright sun, and it really wasn't. And that does really hurt the quality of the image. Messing with the settings yourself, though, probably would fix that. And generally speaking, with good lighting, you should be able to get a decent shot. Going indoors, though, or any situation with less ambient light, you will start to see flaws with noise and grain in darker areas especially, and blurry photos are a lot more common than I would like. In my opinion, you should be able to just pull out your phone and snap a photo without too much effort and end up with something good. That's not often the case here. You're gonna wanna take that extra time to make sure you're stable taking the shot and possibly take multiple photos so one will turn out the way you want it. The ultra wide is mediocre, but for the price points, I won't complain. It's good enough for the rare use case when you do need an ultra wide photo. I would also just snap a couple pictures with the main lens to be safe. And then there's the two megapixel macro camera, which is borderline useless. And honestly, I don't know why they included it. It seems like a very common thing nowadays for cheaper phones to do. I think it's just so they can say they have a triple camera setup on the back. I'm sure that if you took your time and messed around with it, you could produce a nice shot like this here. Realistically, it's honestly not that bad, but it is two megapixels, right? So if you blow it up at all, the detail just isn't there. The macro lens also seems to have some serious noise reduction. It's just so clearly smoothed over. So it doesn't look terrible at first glance, but there's very little detail or sharpness to the image. I just don't like how the camera app basically almost encourages you to use it. Like it has these three settings here, ultra wide, wide, and then the macro lens. I feel like it should be a little bit more hidden because people might use that setting like they would the telephoto on an iPhone where they just do it to get up closer without actually moving closer. And then they end up with a much lower quality image as a result. Not huge on the software there, but all in all here, no surprise, triple lens setup that has three lenses for the sake of marketing over anything else, headlined by the 64 megapixel sensor that tries to make itself sound better than it is. But 
while that might sound bad, going a bit deeper, we do get that actual picture. The picture of a budget smartphone with a mediocre camera, exactly what you should expect for sub $400. And all that being said, something I did want to try was the Google Pixel Camera APK. The Pixel camera is famously very good for not its physical sensor so much as the software, and with some quick hacking of the mainframe mixed with one Google search, you can easily find APKs of the Pixel's camera app that can be downloaded onto your non-Pixel device. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if I just got a poorly optimized version of the app, but it was almost unusable. It crashed constantly, it was extremely laggy, and the pictures I was able to take often were much worse than what the regular camera could produce. So there might be some potential here, but I was unable to really get any positive results. I think as it is, the Nord CE2 produces photos good enough for Instagram and the like. The selfie camera here is 16 megapixels, nothing really to say, it's fine, although it does have that beauty mode on by default. So naturally we have to see what it does when I turn up every single option to its max setting. Honestly, as far as all these filters go, I have seen much worse, but I do find the large anime eyes a little bit silly. I've pretty much ran through everything I wanted to talk about with this phone. It might not be the perfect representation of the Android budget smartphone market, but I think it's probably a pretty decent one, and I do think it's worth the price of around $350. The fact that you can get 90 hertz AMOLED for under $400, I mean, that's pretty crazy at this point, and it was pretty much inconceivable just a few years ago. I think this is a good option for people who want to buy brand new, and they want that fairly premium feeling experience, a lot of the newer features, and aren't too bothered about the longevity of the phone or the cameras. They just want something that works and works well, and this phone can definitely be that. And looks nice. It does look really nice. I wouldn't recommend this phone per se. I think it depends on your own situation, the context of where you are, what's available to you. This is a very specific phone, and there's a lot of other options out there. Whether you are looking at Hekka's own website, or even actually going to used markets like eBay, you can pick up an old Google Pixel 4 or something for pretty darn cheap at this point, and the camera on that phone is going to be quite a bit better. The Pixel 4 in particular does have 90 hertz. The build is more premium, and I just recently bought this for $197 US. This is a Pixel 4 XL, 64 gigs. It's a couple of years old at this point, but it's a pretty decent deal. But buying used is a whole other beast, of course. If you want to buy a budget Android new, this is definitely an option you could look at. And that's about as far as I'll go. Yeah, hope you enjoyed the video. This was a bit different for me. I don't usually look at especially budget Androids, but I had a lot of fun with it, honestly. So thanks again to Hekka for sending it out to me. If you want to check them out, link in the description. But again, not sponsored, don't make money. So up to you completely. But I do thank you for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you found the video interesting or even helpful, maybe hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content just like this. I've got socials. You can follow me if you'd like. And yeah, thanks again for watching. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.